I'm Roberta Glass, and you're listening to my True Crime Report. The innocence movement took a huge hit at the end of last year when the False Memory Syndrome Foundation announced on their website that the organization was dissolving. The mainstream media that embraced the False Media Syndrome Foundation's narrative ignored the story of the group's closing, with the exception of a few tweets, a small Yahoo News article. The story of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation's end went unreported. But what was the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, and how did they manage to convince the public that a syndrome they made up existed? And how did the organization advance their argument that sexual abuse victims were not victims of sexual abuse at all, but instead their memories of abuse were a product of the suggestions of therapists or a product of overzealous investigators, intense interrogations. Psychologists and mental health professionals weren't always to blame. False Memory Syndrome Foundation also pointed to what they called a moral panic that was created among communities struggling with a child sexual abuse case. They pointed to a kind of atmosphere, a witch hunt against innocent parents, daycare providers, teachers, and priests. They also suggested that false claims of child sexual abuse were created in communities because some parents and children didn't want to be left out. Nowhere is this better expressed than in capturing the Freeman's documentary. As far as the families were concerned, I don't want to use the word that they were competitive with each other. I don't know if it's to that extent. You know, sometimes it'd be some idle conversation about, you know, another boy, you know, he was sodomized five times when my son was sodomized six times, you know, as if that meant something in the overall scheme of things. There's a whole community atmosphere that gets created in a mass abuse case like this where the families are talking to each other, they're going to community meetings, or they're calling on the phone all the time, they're seeing each other in group therapy, and there is definitely an element when a community defines itself as a victimized community that... If you're not victimized, you don't fit into that community. In addition to making up a false syndrome and using academic and their professional members to validate and push their narrative in the courtroom and the media, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation also attacked the idea of repressed or recovered memories as scientific or invalid. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation claimed that there were no valid instances or cases of repressed memory, but Brown University's Recovered Memory Project lists 110 examples on their website. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation was formed in 1992 after a 30-year-old Dr. Jennifer Fried accused her father, Peter Fried, a math professor at University of Pennsylvania, of having sexually abused her as a child into her early teens. Dr. Jennifer Fried recovered her memories of abuse after her therapist asked her if she was sexually abused. At first she said no, but after she left therapy, her brain was flooded by memories of sexual abuse at the hands of her father. The Fried family, by all accounts, was unusual. Dr. Jennifer Fried's parents, if her uncle William, Peter's brother is to believe, were stepbrother and sister when they married. What Peter and wife Pamela described as a spirit of sexual openness was seen as inappropriate and sexualized atmosphere that violated their children's boundaries. Dr. Jennifer Fried was supported by her grandmother, Uncle William, and sister, who was not surprised by her accusation of incest and abuse. Her sister said, That's why you put the locks on your bedroom door when she heard her sister's disclosure. To counter their daughter's accusations of abuse, Pamela and Peter Fried 
assembled a mass of highly regarded academics to join the board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Among them was Dr. Ralph Underweiger, a psychologist, Martin T. Orn, professor of psychiatry and psychology at University of Pennsylvania, Margaret Singer, a clinical psychologist who was an expert in coercive persuasion and cults, and Louis Jolyon West, a very famous psychiatrist who headed UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute and was also a critic of Scientology in his later years. Many of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, such as West and Orn, took money for CIA-funded projects, which led some researchers to ask the question if the False Memory Syndrome Foundation itself was a product of intelligence, the intelligence community. Such heady questions I cannot answer in this episode, but I do want to explore how the False Memory Syndrome Foundation wielded such power and influence in its 27-year lifespan. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation's first success was to rewrite the history of the long and complicated Mick Martin's preschool trial in the late 80s as a case of moral and satanic panic. The McMartin trial, where with multiple defendants and preschool age victims proved difficult to prosecute, with all the trials ending in hung juries and or eventual acquittals. I will be looking at McMartin's in depth in another episode. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation and its ideology ideologically aligned journalists have created a myth now accepted by mainstream media and the public that the McMartin's case began with a psychotic or sometimes described as schizophrenic mother, Judy Johnson, detached from reality and deluded, reporting falsely to the police that her son had been abused. The buried truth is both shocking and disturbing. In August of 1983, Judy Johnson observed her three-year-old son bleeding anus. Johnson's son volunteered that Mr. Ray, possibly referring to Raymond Bucky, who worked at the McMartin's preschool, was playing with a thermometer with him. Johnson's son's injuries were reviewed and recorded by three doctors, a family physician, an ER doctor, and a pediatrician, before being reported to the police. It's interesting to point out that the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was formed after an adult remembered years of sexual abuse at the hands of her father would latch on to a case of preschoolers who, according to the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, were unduly pressured by therapists to make up false accusations to satisfy overzealous prosecutors hungry for a conviction. But latch on they did, and when other daycare cases surfaced, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation were quick to compare them to McMartin's and call them a moral panic, a witch hunt, even labeling them Junior McMartin's. Today, we are going to look at two cases that the False Memory Syndrome labeled as such the Margaret Kelly Michaels case, known as the Kelly Michaels case, and the Country Walk Daycare case that convicted Frank and Ileana Fuster. Margaret Kelly Michaels, a nap time supervisor at the Maplewood, New Jersey We Care Daycare Nursery, gave two weeks notice, then left the job before her given notice date. She had confided one day to one of the daycare attendees' mothers that she was leaving early because she was, quote, bleeding from her rectum a lot. Four days later, Dorinda Pierce took her son to the doctor to examine his rash. While getting his temperature taken rectally, Pierce's son exclaimed, This is the way my teacher does it to me at school. When asked which teacher, Pierce responded, Kelly. Dorinda Pierce had never heard of a Kelly working at We Care Daycare 
In fact, most of the parents were unaware that she was the nap time supervisor. When they got home, Pierce asked her son to explain more about what was going on at nap time, and her son responded by leaning against the refrigerator, raising his leg, and rubbing his genitals. Pierce relayed the story to her family doctor, and she followed his suggestion that she call family and children's services, and thus an investigation began. After a nine-month trial and 13-day jury deliberation, Michaels was convicted on 115 counts and given a 47-year sentence. Michaels' defense appealed to the New Jersey Supreme Court, who decided that Michaels could be retried by the state if the state held a hearing and can prove that the child witnesses against Michaels were not unduly influenced by the interview process. On December 1995, the state dropped the charges and Michaels was set free. Michaels does not credit the New Jersey Supreme Court for her freedom. Instead, she said it was the work of one journalist who believed in her story of innocence. It was, in fact, two reporters, Debbie Nathan at The Village Voice and Debbie Rabinowitz at Harper's, that wrote stories pushing the narrative that she was a product of a moral panic and suggestive interviewing techniques. The children's claims were characterized as wild and unbelievable and they suggested that the psychologist had implanted new and false memories of abuse. For example, the children claimed that Kelly Michaels abused them with knives, and supporters of Michaels said that the damage that knives would cause to their anus would be extreme. And this does sound unbelievable until you learn that it was a plastic knife the children were describing to therapists and investigators. And the handle of the knife used quite different than a blade. Michaels was portrayed as a healthy and vibrant woman, but her behavior can be described troubling as best and inappropriate and abusive at worst. One co-worker described how Michaels announced to the other staff she was wearing no underwear. In an county jail, she was caught by the prison guard being sexually groped by her father. More disturbing, she told her fellow prisoner, Charlene Mum, that she, quote, didn't mean to hurt the children, unquote. One of the more unbelievable child abusers that the False Memory Syndrome Foundation has championed was that of Frank Fuster and the Country Walk daycare case. Unlike Michaels, Frank Fuster had a criminal and unsavory past before his own daycare abuse case came to trial. In 1969, he killed an off-duty police officer and was convicted for manslaughter, and his first wife left him after he was charged and convicted with child sexual abuse of a nine-year-old girl. During the Country Walk daycare case, his own lawyer begged the judge to have him removed due to Fuster's physical assault and verbal abuse. When the judge refused to remove him from the case, Fuster's lawyer refused to sit near his client, citing his own safety as the reason. So what was the Country Walk daycare case? Well, for nine months in 1983 to 1984, Frank and his second wife, Ileana Fuster, ran an illegal daycare out of their home in Dade County, Florida. One parent was alerted to Fuster's sexual abuse of her child after her son requested that he kiss his body, body being the family term for genitals. The son explained, quote, Ileana kisses all the baby's bodies. Other parents observed that their children looked drugged after they left the country walk daycare, citing glassy eyes and slow and unsteady movements. 
another country walk attendee was also taken to the doctor for an inflamed vagina and vaginal itch and other children claimed that the foosters had videotaped them but when investigators came with a warrant frank fooster had been given two dates notice and no videos were recovered Eliana Fuster eventually pled guilty to the charges, and Frank Fuster, after a trial, was found guilty. The jury deliberated for one and a half days and was sentenced to 165 years in prison, where he remains to this day. Once again, Debbie Nathan and Dorothy Rabinowitz were claiming that the conviction was a result of a witch hunt and the PBS program Frontline produced a pro fooster documentary with this stomach-turning title of Did Daddy Do It? And as recently as 2013, a article was written in the National Review questioning Fooster's conviction and suggesting that it was the result of a moral panic or, once again, false child abuse allegations. The pro fooster narrative relied once again on distorting the truth. One of the most damning pieces of evidence against Fooster was his six-year-old son's positive test for gonorrhea. Debbie Nathan claimed in her book, Satan Silence, that the test was unreliable, and what made the test positive was normal organisms found in adult and children's throats, Yet Nathan offers a Center for Disease Control study to back up her claim that deals with a totally different test. The actual test done on Fooster's son was the RAPID-NH system test, which was examined in the March 83 Journal of Microbiology and determined to be 100% accurate in the 162 cases they looked at. So how did the Frank Fooster case get spun to be a mini McMartin? Once again, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation moral panic narrative was pushed by writers, and in 1995, the year Kelly Michaels' conviction was overturned, the American Psychological Association published Jeopardy in the Courtroom, a scientific analysis of children's testimonies written by Dr. Stephen Cece and Maggie Brook. The authors characterized the country walk child victims' claims as both plausible and fantastic. For example, the book claims that some of the victims described riding on sharks. When witch hunt narrative author Ross Chait examined the transcript of the trials as well as reviewing 80 hours of the children's interviews, he could find only one child's mention of a stuffed shark that was in front of him in the interview room. The children's accusations that they were made to play with their own excrement was also used as an example of wild and unbelievable claims pulled out of the victim's imagination. However, during the investigation, a picture of Frank Fooster's own son in a bathroom surface, surrounded by his own smeared feces on the wall, and that picture seemed to support the children's claims. The most recent example of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation in popular culture can be seen in the 2003 Oscar-nominated Capturing the Freedmans, which examined the 1988 sexual abuse case of the Freedman family. Both Arnold Friedman and his son Jesse were accused and later convicted of abusing boys who had been enrolled in Arnold Friedman's computer class that he taught out of the family home. Even though Arnold Friedman admitted to being a pedophile and ultimately pled guilty to not only child pornography charges, but abusing the boys in his computer class, the film raises doubt about once again fantastical and unbelievable claims of the victims of Arnold and Jesse Friedman. And the film suggests that Jesse Friedman is actually innocent, even though Jesse Friedman also pled guilty to the charges. <laughs> 
The film argues that Jesse Friedman had no other choice but to plead guilty in such a climate of moral panic. Capturing the Freedmans was warmly received by critics and audiences, and Jesse Friedman gave numerous print and TV interviews, as well as presentations to colleges with his lawyer at his side about his unjust conviction. There was only one problem. It all was a lie. In addition to his media tour, Friedman also appealed his conviction. And in 2010, a federal appeals court upheld his conviction with the recommendation that the prosecutors reopen Friedman's case. Nassau County DA Kathleen Rice took the court's suggestion with a team that included the Innocence Project's Barry Sheck, and they reviewed Jesse Friedman's case. The result was devastating to Jesse Friedman's claims of innocence. A 150-page report was released by the DA's office on June 24, 2013, and it detailed all the things the documentary left out, including the incriminating details the public was unaware of, including a third defendant, Ross Goldstein, who also pled guilty to the charges of child sexual abuse. Also included was the assessment by a psychiatrist hired by Friedman's lawyer that Jesse was a psychopath and narcissist. The report also described the disciplinary action that was taken against Jesse Friedman in prison when he was caught writing and possessing child pornography. And his fictional offerings included the descriptions of bestiality, incest, and child rape. The campaign for Jesse Freeman's exoneration limped along for a few years after the DA's report, with Friedman unsuccessfully suing the DA's office for slander, but eventually petered out. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation is officially over, but the myth of the False Memory Syndrome is deeply embedded in our culture as is the idea of a moral panic as the cause for false sexual abuse allegations. Why was such a small organization able to rewrite history? How were they able to successfully inject their narrative into the mainstream media? As Mike Stanton writes in the Columbia Journalism Review, A study published in 1996 by a University of Michigan sociologist, Catherine Beckett, found a sharp shift in how four leading magazines, Time, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, and People, treated sexual abuse. In 1991, before the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, more than 80% of the coverage was weighted towards stories of survivors with recovered memory taken for granted and questionable therapy virtually ignored. By 1994, more than 80% of the coverage focused on false accusations, often involving supposedly false memory. Beckett credited the False Memory Syndrome Foundation with a major role in the change. There are a few clues as to how the False Memory Syndrome Foundation operated. Psychologist Dr. Anna Salter wrote a piece entitled Confessions of a Whistleblower, Lessons Learned, which was published in Ethics and Behavior, Volume 8, Issue 2, June 1998, in which she described a campaign of harassment against her by False Memory Syndrome Foundation members. To quote from the abstract, quote, In 1998, I began a report on the accuracy of expert testimony in child sexual abuse cases utilizing Ralph Underwager and Haleda Wakefield as a case study. In response, Underwager and Wakefield began a campaign of harassment and intimidation, which included multiple lawsuits, an ethics charge, phony and secretly taped phone calls, and ad hominem attacks including one that I was laundering federal grant monies, unquote. Psychotherapist David L. Califf wrote in the same issue of Ethics and Behavior that he endured harassment from Seattle False Memory Syndrome Foundation members led by Chuck Noah. 
Chuck Noah was a father accused by his daughter of sexual abuse. Noah led a picket outside Caliph's practice where he and other protesters held up signs, some reading, quote, David Caliph sexploits women, unquote. Another one read, quote, families expose terrorists, psycho, therapists, unquote. Another read, Beware, Caliph's crooked, feminazi power lies. Caliph also endured lawsuits from Seattle False Memory Syndrome Foundation members. One Francine case bearer filed multiple lawsuits. The most notable alleged that Caliph, along with his wife, were conspiring with the Seattle Chief of Police and the Seattle District Court judge to deny her her right to free speech. The suit was deemed frivolous and thrown out of court multiple times, but pickets and lawsuits successfully sent the message that if you oppose the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, you would suffer. Lawyer R. Christopher Barden was the attorney for the False Memory Syndrome Foundation in many of these cases. He boasted that he had successfully sued over 20 therapists for implanting false memories and gave presentations at many False Memory Syndrome Foundation conferences. One of the most disturbing techniques of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was that False Memory Syndrome Foundation members often posed as patients and secretly recorded the therapy sessions. Pamela Fried is quoted as advising parents, quote, follow your child to the office, hire a private investigator, pry the information from other relatives your child may talk to, pose as a patient yourself, unquote. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation was not without controversy when member Ralph Underwager gave an interview to a Dutch magazine and said, quote, Pedophiles need to become more positive and make the claim that pedophilia is an acceptable expression of God's will for love and unity among human beings. Unquote. He was asked to step down from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation's board. Elizabeth Luftus, a media darling as a memory expert, was sued in civil court and settled for defamation and invasion of privacy for hiring a private investigator to uncover the identity of a child abuse study subject that Luftus was certain was a case of false memories. In Luftus's 2013 TED Talk, After warning the audience that, quote, misinformation was everywhere, Luftus went on to mischaracterize her own lawsuit as a byproduct of being controversial. Well, to my surprise, when I published this work and began to speak out against this particular brand of psychotherapy, it created some pretty bad problems for me. Hostilities primarily from the repressed memory therapists who felt under attack and by the patients whom they had influenced. I had sometimes armed guards at speeches that I was invited to give, people trying to drum up letter writing campaigns to get me fired. But probably the worst was I suspected that a woman was innocent of abuse that was being claimed by her grown daughter. She accused her mother uh, of sexual abuse based on a repressed memory. And this accusing daughter had actually allowed her story to be filmed and presented in public places. I was suspicious of this story, and so I started to investigate and eventually found information that convinced me that this mother was innocent. I published an expose on the case, and a little while later, the accusing daughter filed a lawsuit. Even though I'd never mentioned her name, she sued me for defamation and invasion of privacy. And I went through nearly five years of dealing with this messy, uh, un- um, unpleasant uh, litigation. But, but finally, finally, it was over, and I could really uh, get back uh, to my work. Was it the rise of the Me Too era that brought the False Memory Syndrome Foundation to an end? 
It's interesting to note that Luftus agreed to be an expert witness for the defense in the Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein cases. And though the False Memory Syndrome Foundation has closed its door, the ideologically aligned National Center for Reason and Justice is still advocating on their website for the innocence of convicted pedophiles like Frank Fuster and Jesse Friedman. But it's interesting to note that writer Debbie Nathan, who once was on the board of the National Center for Reason and Justice, is no longer listed, and her bio has been rewritten to downplay her work pushing the False Memory Syndrome Foundation narrative, and instead is highlighting her decades of work covering border issues and immigration. Maybe Nathan watched author Mark Pendergrass's failure when he published his book, The Most Hated Man in America, Jerry Sandusky and the Rush to Judgment, which, despite Elizabeth Luftus' enthusiastic endorsement on the back cover of the book, was not a bestseller. Pendergrast, a volunteer for the National Center for Reason and Justice, had success with three books about the phenomenon of false memories. Memory Warp, the other one is Victims of Memory, and the third, The Repressed Memory Epidemic, How It Happened and What We Need to Learn from It. Pendergrass considers himself a victim of false memories after his two daughters accused him of sexual abuse and cut him off. They have never recanted their accusations. Most Americans have never heard of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, but their organization's ideas of satanic panic and false memories and recovered memories as bogus and untrustworthy are firmly implanted in the American psyche. When tenured Brown professor Ross Chait published his exhaustive exploration of the 1980s sex abuse cases called the Witch Hunt Narrative, In 2014, it was largely ignored by the media, despite the fact that it took 15 years of work and blew the myth of the McMartin preschool case as a product of moral panic. In researching this episode, I was constantly nagged by the question, Why, when we are winning in the war against the innocent movement, does it feel like we are losing? In California, the statute of limitations for sex offenses has been extended, something Fried and the False Memory Syndrome Foundation fought against. In other high-profile court cases and post-trial litigation, such as Stephen Avery and the Adnan Syed cases, we have time and time again come up the winner. Yet, the innocence movement has hold of the American media. Whether it's false confessions, or untrustworthy DNA, or false memories, the conclusion is, is that our justice system does not work. That is the conclusion that the innocent movement wants us to believe. And when a conviction is overturned, the media reports that the newly released was convicted with no evidence, and no one stops to ask, why were they convicted in the first place? Maybe Elizabeth Loftus is right. Misinformation is everywhere.